I just, uh, I just feel overwhelmed by the presence of God that's in the room right now. And I love these services. Uh, I love Sunday mornings and the traditions and rhythms that we have there. But I love the opportunity to gather on a Friday night to break out of our rhythms. Many of you guys on a typical Friday night, maybe you're in some taking your kids to an athletic competition. Maybe you're doing a family pizza movie night. Maybe you're out doing something fun. But on this Friday night, we're here gathered together as the people of God to reflect on the person of Jesus. And every time I begin to prepare a message around this Good Friday text, you know, the different, every gospel tells this story. There's different angles, different characters, different perspectives that are shared. Um, every time there's, there's, there's so many different places I want to go and, and, and so many aspects I want to talk about and begin to unpackage uh, for us. And as I was praying over what does this year, 2024, the focus, what does it need to look like? Where do we need to go uh, tonight, this evening, as we prepare for Easter Sunday? Um, I really felt God leading me to the portion of this story that is Jesus's trial. It's really a mockery of a trial. Um, he's, right, he, he has this moment where he is accused and he's brought to Pontius Pilate and he stands trial. Uh, it is not a justifiable trial. And I think at this moment, we can have a human response. And that human response is to feel the frustration of when you've been falsely accused. Have you ever had somebody accuse you of something you haven't done? Have you ever had somebody twist a story, get it wrong a little bit? Come on, we've got some of the elementary kids in here. Have you ever had a friend or a sibling blame something on you? It's infuriating, right? We don't have to teach children how to say it's not my fault or he did it, right? We were really, really gifted at, at, at pushing blame, skirting blame, or really, if we're being honest, fighting for justice, it's human nature that when we are falsely accused, I mean, it, it makes our blood boil. Every real argument or fight, in fact, is because somebody feels like their side isn't being heard, that they're being misrepresented, that the truth is being misconstrued, that they're being falsely blamed. And so we fight and we argue and, and we, we defend ourselves and we want people to know our side. And if only you knew the whole story, you wouldn't see it that way. And if you just saw it through my eyes and, and it's so difficult to read this story and to start to think about Jesus and you go, ah, like to be in that situation. Jesus, you were this incredible communicator. Thousands would gather to hear you preach. And you could do it without a microphone, mind you. Like you, he must have been good at projecting his voice. This guy could not have had like a soft squeaky voice. Like he had to be able to like deliver the word. It's like a large crowds would gather. And here he is. You're kind of waiting for this moment. He's standing trial Judas has sold him. He's, he's been taken captive. His disciples wanted to fight. He says, don't. And here he is, and he's just being quiet. It's so frustrating. <clears throat> Why are you being quiet? Speak up for yourself. Stand up. I mean, isn't your blood boiling at these false accusations? And you hear Jesus, he's quiet. That reading was out of Matthew, or out of Mark, but I want to read again out of Matthew chapter 27 and isolate a few verses for us this evening. I'm going to start in verse 18 or verse 15. It says this: It was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner. I think this is important. This is a famous person. He has become famous for what he did. And Mark lets us know that it was for insurrection. Uh, this man, this well-known prisoner whose name was Matthew, lets us know his first name and his last name. His first name was actually Jesus. He was Jesus Barabbas. Jesus was a, actually a common name at the time even. Uh, they would, Jesus didn't, wasn't the first, Jesus Christ wasn't the first one to even make this famous. So Jesus Barabbas, and he's famous for insurrection. He was a zealot. And if you 
have heard my preaching recently, you know, we talked about on uh, this last Sunday, on Palm Sunday, that they wanted Jesus to be zealous. They wanted Jesus to cause an insurrection. That's why they waved their palm branches, which was their sign of victory. And it was, had been their sign of victory for over 150 years, ever since a successful insurrection. And so here they want Jesus to be Barabbas. The crowd, the people gathered, they wanted Jesus Christ to be a little bit more like Jesus Barabbas. They wanted him to be a zealot. They wanted him to rise up and create this insurrection. You know, it's funny, the picture that always gets painted, I actually think Barabbas is a very misconstrued character. Here's why. We, he's more famous for being known as a murderer than an insurrectionist leading a rebellion. And because he's always painted in movies or shows, he's always painted as like this six foot eight burly guy who's like, and he comes out in chains and he looks like he's going to rip your arms off and you're like, Barabbas. And he's this intense character and you're like, that guy's killed a lot of people. Like, he's a murderer. Yeah, we don't like him and we paint this contrast and yet Barabbas seemed to be a little bit more dynamic. If he was famous during the insurrection that he was arrested for, could it be that he was actually a vocal leader? This dude might have even been attractive, you know what I mean? Like he might have been people, somebody that people were drawn to and he was a leader in the community and he was well known. His murder was during an insurrection. It wasn't cold-blooded killing likely. It was justifiable murder in the eyes of the Israelites. They would have been like, no, 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 it's all, like what he did, like it's okay. And so they are in this moment saying, I want Jesus Barabbas. Now Barabbas comes from uh, the, the, the phrase Bar Abba, which means son of the father, or Bar Robin, which means son of the teacher. So he's literally Jesus, son of the father. He is a version that is more acceptable to the crowd. He is the one that they want. And actually what's so interesting is Jesus didn't lead an insurrection, so they falsely accuse him of being an insurrectionist. That's the charges they're trying to get to stick on Jesus Christ. And they're saying, you know what? Actually, we'll exchange. This guy came in, he's really disappointing. He came in, he turned over the tables in our temple. He didn't do what we want. He's not the guy we want. We want Barabbas. We want this guy. He's going to lead us to victory. He's going to fight the battles. He's willing to get bloody. He's willing to get down in the trenches and do the real work, do the hard stuff. He's willing. He's the kind of leader that we want. And in this moment, I mean, the, in, the, the, the audacity to accuse Jesus Christ of the very sins that Barabbas is guilty of, well fighting for Barabbas' freedom. I mean, I can't imagine the feelings. Yes, Jesus was fully God, but he was fully human, tempted as you are. <laughs> I think the temptation was there. <laughs> I just don't think he acted on it. Could it be? I just wonder because of the humanity of Jesus in this moment. Did he know if I open my mouth, the words that are going to come out? Have you ever just decided I'm not going to say anything? Come on, kids, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And in this moment, Jesus is going, I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm going to stay focused on what God has called me to do. I'm going to, I'm going to do what is needed. And so when he says, do you want Jesus Barabbas? or Jesus who is called the Messiah, for he knew it was out of the self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed in his place. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked, and they all answered, crucify him crucify him. Now see, when we hear this story and we, we begin to see this picture of this trial taking place, one of the tensions and, and actually even sometimes the temptations is to sort of think that we relate more with Jesus in this story. 
And yet one of the interesting things that we see in scripture is that many real life situations paint an illustration of our lives. And in this moment, Jesus the Messiah and Jesus Barabbas are painting a picture of you and I. Except we're not Jesus the Messiah. We are Jesus Barabbas in this story. And you say, no, 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 Pastor Sam, I could never be Barabbas, big burly murderer. That's not me. I don't kill people. I, I don't murder. I don't, I don't sin like that. I could never relate with Barabbas. And yet, what did Jesus do in all of his teachings? Let's think about Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 first. He said, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. Yeah, murderers like Barabbas. But anyone who, mur and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, uh-oh, uh-oh, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, an Aramaic word for contempt, whoever has contempt in their heart for another person, maybe you feel justified in your contempt, maybe you feel like they wrongly accused you, like you um, have the right story, and if only people heard your side, then they would be on your side, and you need to fight for your own justification, and you've got contempt in your heart. If so, you're answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Can we remember that Jesus upped the ante on sin? Oh, if you even look lustfully, you commit adultery. If you have anger in your heart, it's akin to murder. Why did he up the ante on sin? Because he needed to position himself in such a way that he was the only way. He needed to remind each and every one of us to not sort of become holier than thou or feel that we are righteous by our own works, that we somehow are better than Barabbas. Because let me tell you, when it comes to your eternity, you are in the same position as Barabbas. You are guilty. You are guilty. And unless somebody takes your place, Crucifixion is the end result. Your life is at stake. And so we stand trial, and this picture helps us understand what Jesus is, what he does, what he's all about. Because what does Jesus do? He stands there and is accused of the very sins that Barabbas commits, and he takes it. And he takes it. The sins that you committed this week... This month, this year, Jesus didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. You are accused. You have been found guilty of sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have. But here we see a story where Jesus takes the false accusation from the court in order for Barabbas to receive undeserved justification. You see, in Barabbas, we see our guilt. In the crowd, we find our accusers. But in Jesus, we find our hope. We know that the wages of sin are death. And this was quite literal for Barabbas. But eternal death, death pales in comparison to earthly death. Jesus doesn't just take your penalty. He actually wipes away, sounds out your accusers. And realize this, I, one of the things that frustrates me the most is in, in this story, I just, I get so frustrated by the crowd. I get so frustrated by their celebration on Palm Sunday and them accusing Jesus here on Good Friday. Luke put it this way in chapter 23, verse 10. He said this, the, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Like, like they are aggressive. They're throwing out everything they can. They are causing a scene to accuse Jesus, to try to get something to stick. They've got the best lawyers in the land, all worked up, veins popping in their neck, wagging their fingers, vehemently accusing Jesus. They're coming at him. 
And the reality is there is no accusation that can stick on Jesus. And I couldn't help but consider as I studied this story of Jesus Barabbas and Jesus the Messiah in this court case that's taking place, I couldn't help but reflect on what we know is coming as believers and unbelievers alike, that there is a judgment day coming where we are going to come face to face with our Father in heaven and our Savior is going to be there. And can I tell you that on judgment day, you are the accused. And much like this moment where the accusers are happening, the, the, we, we know what has taken place, we know the sin we have caused, Jesus the Messiah is going to step in and he's going to say, you're no longer accused, I covered it. I'll take the accusations on myself. I will quietly take it. I already fought death, hell, and the grave. I will stand in the gap. I am going to cover you. This is a picture of judgment day, and we are Barabbas. I don't want to be Barabbas. That's not the character I want to connect with. We don't ever want to be the character that fails or is known for something wrong, and yet here we are, we are helpless without our Savior. We are broken in sin, we have made mistakes, and we are found guilty, and we have accusers. But the guilty party cannot make you innocent. It take, requires the innocent person to cover your guilt. But if we feel even somewhat holy and righteous on our own, then we actually diminish the value of the price that was paid for us. Can we remember that Jesus was bought for only 30 coins and yet he paid for you with his entire life. He was accused of our failures. We are guilty, he is innocent. And yet he says, you are worthy of my entire existence. You are worthy of my life. I will go to the cross for you, even though you are guilty. And one of the things that is so important to grasp by the price that was paid by Jesus is that in that moment, he determined your value. Can I remind us, they tried to sell him for only 30 coins they tried to put this low level value on Jesus and yet he paid a price for you. Value is always determined by what people are willing to pay. And Jesus was willing to pay with his life to cover what you are guilty of. I'm guilty. He's being accused of the very sins I have committed and he stands there and he takes it. And he pays the ultimate price. And the guilty, me, by definition, cannot be found innocent. I am guilty. A good judge will always come to a guilty verdict on the guilty party. That's the goal of a trial. And on judgment day, I will be found guilty unless an innocent person is willing to pay the price, stand in the gap, and take my place. I am Barabbas. I'm Barabbas. I need a savior. I am in desperate need where I stand for somebody to take the accusation, to take the punishment. The band can start making their way up on the stage. So as we begin to move forward with tonight's service, when was the last time you considered your guilt? You see, if I don't understand my guilt, I don't understand my need for grace. And sometimes we accept the free gift of salvation. We say yes to the, the promise of salvation that Jesus offers. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. Cannot wait for Easter Sunday. I've already got an entire message written. It's going to continue this story. I just can't wait. It's going to be amazing just to be together. But it, sometimes we accept that free gift, we receive the grace, we feel freedom from our guilt, and somehow if you've been here and you've been serving Jesus for a little bit of time or a really long time, we can start to grow numb to that guilt. And there's this temptation that the enemy has for Christians, for Christ followers, 
It's the road of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's the road of the religious leaders. It's actually the road of the zealots too. The more I've been studying the political movement that was known as the zealots during Jesus's time, we actually spend too much time on the Pharisees and Sadducees who were too religious. And then we don't spend enough time on this progressive sort of thinking, the zealot, we're gonna take charge, we're gonna fight, we're gonna attack. We're gonna... There was these two camps and Jesus goes, both of these are broken. And the world's constantly trying to divide into these two camps. They have different names, different brands, different looks, different leaders, but they create these polarizations and Jesus was a uniter of those things. And so often we can get to a place where we fall into a different camp of saying, I, you know what, I'm gonna take this into my own hands and I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna fix the world, I'm gonna solve some problems. I'm, I'm gonna distance myself from my guilt. I'm gonna start to feel pretty righteous. How do you end up with the Crusades, <laughs> right? It's so hard to imagine and yet, the longer you start to feel like you are righteous by your actions, righteous by your deeds, like you're a pretty good person. The further you feel from Barabbas, the more danger you're in. Because I don't wanna get to judgment day desperately needing a savior to stand in the gap for me while the accusations of what I actually did, not false, justified accusations of my sin, my shortcomings, my failures, my anger, my junk. I desperately do not want to hear, man, you, you did a lot in my name, but I never knew you. Get away from me. I desperately want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I know that good and faithful according to scripture is not perfect. But good and faithful requires Jesus to be my full savior. It requires me to have a lifestyle of repentance. It requires you to not get so far from the guilt that you abuse grace. I need grace every single day. I need grace to breathe. I need grace to live. I need grace for my marriage. I need grace for my family. I need grace as a dad. I need grace today. I need Jesus because there are accusations that are true. I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I so desperately want to be welcomed into his glory. What a desperate sinner I am. But thank God for Jesus. Who says, I'm going to make a way where there was no way. I'm going to take your punishment. I got it. I'm going to take, where are your accusers now? They got nothing on me. They're not wrong about you, but they got nothing on me. And so where are your accusers? Come, be with me, be in my presence. The church needs to get back to repentance, it needs to get back to a conviction from sin, and a conviction to move towards Jesus and be covered. Sin is a battle you can never beat on your own. You don't have the strength, you can't do it. it. Requires Jesus. And Good Friday is a night not to express pity for Jesus. Oh man, don't we feel bad that he was whipped and nailed to a cross? How oh, we feel bad. Let's feel bad for him, give him some thoughts good vibes because I feel bad for Jesus. No, it's a day to feel repentant of our sins, to feel conviction from our mistakes and to remind our souls of his grace. Let me say it again. Good Friday is not a day to express pity for Jesus. It is a day to feel repentant of our sin and remind our very souls of his grace 
that covers me. And because of his grace, I get to share in his glory. And so as a church, we're going to receive communion. This is the way that we do this. Reminding ourselves that without his broken body, without his shed blood, we're Barabbas. We're guilty. With no hope facing crucifixion. Jesus, Barabbas is not the way. Taking into your own hands is not the way. Controlling your life is not the way. Jesus, the Messiah, he's the only way. Nobody can get to the Father except through him. And what we're about to do is reflect on that. Typically on a Sunday, if we take communion and receive it together, we got communion cups and we do this really organized, systematic approach and it's really effective. And, um, and, but today, we're going to slow it down. We're going to get reflective. And so we've um, set up some tables. I think we've got some ushers to help with this. And we're going to line up and we're going to come forward to receive communion. And some of you might immediately start thinking, I think there's a, there's a quicker, more effective way to do this. No, we're doing this intention. I know it's going to take longer. It's okay. It's okay. There's no next service coming in. What you're going to do is you're going to get in line. And as you're in line, I just, I would ask that you stay quiet. The worship team's going to lead. You can sing if you want. But I want you to reflect on the message I just preached. I want you to reflect Think about what you maybe even need to repent from. What if as you come down, you just begin that steady stream of repentance, confession of sin, beginning to process Jesus and who he is. You're going to receive the elements from the ushers and take them back to your seats and please wait. When everybody's received their elements, we're going to receive communion together. So let me pray as we stand to our feet. Then I'll give some more instruction. Jesus, we pray right now in this moment that you would meet us in this. You actually commanded us to do, receive communion together and to do it in remembrance of you. So in this moment, we take time to reflect, to remember, to slow it down. Would we not think about where we need to go next or what's coming up? But God, would we slow it down and spend time with you? Move right now. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.